imagine it's not a viral kind of virus. It's a, maybe like a thought virus. What if we're poisoning each other all day long? Internal hatred had inflicted a catastrophe on Israel and the people were exiled to Babylon. Listen to the podcast and think about the meaning of your life. That's a perfect thing to do in quarantine. When all of Israel are in complete unity, no harm will come upon them. Each year on Purim, we celebrate the miracle of our survival because in the very last minute, Mordechai, the Jew, united all of the Jews. This is the power of Israel. When they are all one bundle, when they are united together, they are rewarded and delivered. The Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Okay, okay listen, listen, enough of that shit. This is a podcast, and we're, we're not going to try to find, we're going to find the solution to anti-Semitism, okay? We're going to stop that right here, right now, from this stinking basement. When we get to the bottom of this, we're going to read from this mystery book, which you're not going to find out about until the end of the series, and we're going to really entertain every perspective. We're not going to say, oh, you can't say this, you can't say that. No, we're going to say everything, because if we're not going to be able to talk about it, we're not going to be able to solve it. You know, we're going to really grab you in the kishke, and we're going to squeeze until we get something, right? And either a bowel movement or a freaking solution. We want to know what happened, what happened 3,500 years ago in Babylon that started this whole Meshuggahs, and we want to finish it here in 2020. That's it. The rise and the ruin of the first temple. It's hardly a secret that the Jewish ego is well developed, Leo. Hardly a secret. (laughs) Some will say it is too developed, but there are benefits to having a big ego, provided it is used correctly. Be that as it may, vowing to unite as one man with one heart is one thing. Living out that vow is a very different story. It is the ultimate test to human nature. And although the ancient Hebrews were bold enough to take on the challenge, they failed left and right. That's everybody. Reminds us. This is what we're uh, up against, I think, uh, isn't it? This question, I think, if you bring it up to any Jewish person, look, you're chosen to do this thing, to unite above the growing ego. What a mistake God made, right? Yeah. Choosing such, these people who constantly didn't even know, couldn't he have picked somebody better? Wasn't there anyone better to do the job? Well, that's the question, really. I mean, can someone do this job and can this someone be a Jew? Uh, you know, were, were they actually at any point in history able to do it? That's what I hope we'll see today. Uh, on the- where, where is this thing of like, okay, he picked you and so just do it. Like, why do you, what is the thing of even the mistakes, right? Like if he picked you. So, I mean, that's kind of the way I think that, that the world sees the Jews like, okay, you keep screwing up. You're a failure. You're bad because he told you to do it and you're just not doing it. What's wrong with you? Well, if it was so simple, uh, that would actually make things very easy if uh, if that's what the Isn't world... Is that kind of the complaint against us though? Like, well, all right, just do it. Why don't you do it? I don't know. The, do it, I, just... I'm looking on Twitter. The complaint is that the Jews are spreading the coronavirus. The Zionists mm. who are behind the coronavirus. Well, that's the kind them, of complaint... Only took them three weeks to accuse us. Yeah, no, it's it's no, it's it's been a couple of months, I think, uh, since the beginning of the year. It took some time, but you know, so that's usually the kind of um, finger pointing that you get. It's not the creator or some higher law in nature uh, compelled you to act a certain way towards the rest of humanity, and you're not. And that's not usually how people talk about it, right? I think that there is that, actually. I think that that happens in some religious communities. They look at the Jews like, okay, look, you had your chance and you failed. Now it's it's our turn. Now we get to run at this. Well, I, by all means, uh, if anyone knows how to uh, you know, <laughs> put things in order here, you know, I, for one, would, uh, would love to see it. I think now uh, the world is, uh, you know, is thrust into a new era, really, with this, uh, with this virus. We're not going to make this podcast today about the virus, but it is there. It is, in, it is literally in the air, metaphorically in the air. And yet um, I don't see anyone rising to the occasion 
to see more of the same bickering. In fact, Seth, there was a, they ran a uh, um, they ran a simulation a year ago uh, in some political institute outside of DC. They ran a simulation on uh, potential things that could happen in the world in the next year. One of the simulations, believe it or not, was the uh, outbreak of a uh, of a strain of coronavirus from the east. Uh, that will basically spread around the world and what will happen, how countries will react to it. And they said that the, the main conclusion of the study was that countries need to communicate, but they will fail to do so because they don't trust one another. So that's mm. that's kind of like the, that's exactly the place where, uh, you know, a hub of some sorts, right? A, a communications hub, uh, someone who can act as a mediator, as a connector between the pieces can play a very good role. For example, I don't see anyone doing it. I certainly don't see Jews doing it. I know some people, uh, some Jews who are trying to do it, but it's like one of those places I think uh, time will tell that we need to do a better job uh, it's, doing... it's as if humanity has, has been has been running towards each other in this like um, just with commerce and travel and you know we're vacationing here and we're going there and we're getting goods from there and everything is crisscrossing the the world so quickly so fast everything's going everywhere everywhere and then stop yeah. everyone back to your places everyone you go back to your nest you go back to your cave you go back to your hut you go back to your treehouse everyone. Shh, Settle down. Now, all these pieces are back intact, and now we have to, like you're saying, connect them. Now, uh, we have to have a coordinated effort between them. Now we all know each other. We all know what's going on everywhere, and now we're, we're back at home. And Yeah, I, th yeah I, think, uh, I think once the dust settles a little bit and people realize that this is not a two-week uh, forced vacation, but it's actually a, a change in uh, attitudes and behaviors and habits. I think then the the there will be some sort of a um, maybe an, an unconscious uh, or again an irrational kind of yearning for someone to fix it. You know, fix it, but put the pieces back together somehow. Uh, and I know right now it sounds like a big leap of the imagination. Maybe in our next episode we'll devote a bit more time to this virus. Uh, you know, what, what does it uh, kind of what does it say about how we are interconnected, um, negatively interconnected, how we are negatively impacting one another, but how it's also forcing us to start considering one another in new ways. Again, all the hallmarks of a network that is either working well or is failing miserably. Yeah, when, when we've been reading this book, I was getting the feeling that if you can kind of almost strip the personalities, strip the characters off, you can like redress them in different generations. It's like patterns. Let's read a little bit here because I want to I want to ride on this story with what we're talking about because I see all kind of places where we can slide in and out between current events and these kind of. Yeah, I think I think this uh, this uh, chapter is going to touch on the temple. Right. Uh, and what it symbolizes. The temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem, which we now recognize as the first temple, symbolizes the highest level of unity within the people of Israel. But the decay, mm, but the decay set, set in rapidly after the conquest of Joshua, writes the above mentioned historian Paul Johnson. It again appeared under Solomon and was repeated in both northern and southern kingdoms. Uh, especially under rich and powerful kings when times were good. Th those were Israel and Judea, by the way, just the north and south. The northern and southern kingdom, right, of Israel. Okay. In, in other words, even at times of peace and abundance, there was constant strife and division, which eventually led to the ruin of the temple. First, the nation divided into two kingdoms, Israel and Judea. Israel abandoned their vow of unity and mingled heavily, especially the leaders with the neighboring nations. The Talmud describes the leaders' malevolence towards each other very poignantly. Rabbi Elazar said, Those people who eat and drink with, them, with one another stab each other with swords in their tongues. Thus, even though they were close to one another, Yikes. they were filled with hatred for each other. However, the Talmud emphasizes that the hatred was only among the leaders of the nation, while the majority of Israel did not hate one another. Before we continue, just, uh, you know, they talk about how... Uh Israel abandoned their vow of unity and mingled heavily. And I think uh, it's worth mentioning that maybe if you're a Jewish person listening to this and you live in America, and maybe uh, you know maybe your your wife is not Jewish, or maybe your son married someone who's not Jewish, or your daughter married someone who's not Jewish, 
uh, you're thinking, well, is, is, is he talking about, you know, this, this kind of uh, mingling? Is this what it's been this implying? I just want to make clear that I don't think, you don't think, nobody thinks that uh, any of those acts in and of themselves have anything to do with the attitudes of people towards Jews. Rather, that uh, these things are simply a symptom of our move away from this ideal of unity. And it's just been, it's just being expressed in this way, when it becomes less important to maintain this inner ideal, then also externally, there's no real reason to remain connected. Because as we said, this is a group that was established around an ideology. So what's the big idea? What's, what's so important about marrying someone within the community? If we don't have this ideal that's tying us together, then uh, screw that. You know, why, why do I need to uh, marry within the community? Yeah, actually, even less of a chance for some weird genetic mutation, right? <laughs> Let me just, exp- you know, open up the pool, <laughs> the gene pool a little bit. So I just wanted to make that distinction. You can even go further than that. I mean, uh, Moses married a Midianite. But she joined it. You're absolutely right. Well, so, okay, but, but just from what you're saying is it doesn't matter really where someone's from. It, we're talking exactly. about Israel here is, is, a, is an inclination, right? So when you say the community, you're talking about the community of, of maybe like-hearted, like-minded people, not a community of, of uh, gene pool Exactly. I think that's what just That's exactly what I'm saying. So, although there's a, there's there has been people a lot need, of people need to get to people need to get to know you, Leo, you know. You have to understand. <laughs> well, what you're saying. I, I'm I'm uh, stuck in Israel right now, by the way. This is important <laughs> to say that this the Jew function today is is a uh, is a intercontinental. Seth in uh, all the way out in uh, New Jersey and I'm all the way out in uh, in Israel somewhere. Uh, so that's interesting. What what I'm trying to say is that um all that talk about who should marry whom, it's not about that. It's simply a, an expression of a departure from an idea, an ideal. That's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about a, a specific hypothesis. Yeah. That said it. The absolute hatred was to come in the second temple, and its horrific consequences would become a symbol of the cost of internal hatred. But even the level of separation and hatred of the ancient Israelites toward their brethren in Judea that appeared during the first temple was enough to lead to their complete disappearance. Indeed, all ten tribes that were part of the kingdom of Israel are lost today, as is the kingdom they had built. The Jews of today are the descendants of the Hebrews who occupied the kingdom of Judea, which was but a fraction of the original people of Israel. By the way, by the way, by the way, they just did a, a genetic study. Uh, apparently, 25% of all Latino people, I Latin American, you saw it? amazing. 25% yeah, of them have, also ju- Jews. have Jewish genes. Yeah. So, now, yeah, I don't ten- want to say this, but I'm wondering if maybe if like all the Taliban are going to turn out to be Jewish or something. It's it's possible, you know. Uh, the, you know what they say that uh, the, the people you uh, you know you have the strongest uh, feelings towards, even if they're feelings of animosity, you're probably the closest to. So. Um, if if all the Jews we know today are from two of the twelve tribes, yeah, right. Where are the other ten? Right. Pre pre World War Two numbers, you know, there's times that by um, if that was twenty percent, no, that's less than twenty percent of of the total Jewish population. So there's got to be a couple hundred million. Yeah. Picture this. We figure <laughs> out. Picture this. We figure out what makes this. You know, what is the function of the of the Jewish person in this world? And yeah, suddenly in a, in, a, in a heartbeat, suddenly hundreds of millions of people wake up to that saying, oh, hey, I feel that too. And then, you know, later some professor is going to do the genetic study. is going to find out that they're somehow related to these tribes. And yeah, we have, we're so clueless about how these things work, Seth. So clueless. Just again, this virus is in the air. So, you know, just like the virus, everybody's like, where did it come from? Well, you know, some bat soup. Yeah, no, not where did it make its first appearance, but where did it come? How did it appear mm. suddenly? How did it, Why? you know, yeah. materialize in nature? Why? What, what is it pushing us to realize? This is the questions we don't normally ask because we're, we're, right. we don't think there are answers because we think we're delusional. We think reality to, started yesterday. Yeah, we, we're like kids. Oh, stuff just happened. I think the, the funny thing is that we're willing to acknowledge that there are laws in nature, that we live in a closed system, interconnected, and there are laws, but we're not willing to maybe ask the next question where, you know, where those laws come from. 
not a person, an entity, but like, are they leading to a sort of a, a, a general law or a general well, let plan? Let me tell you about this. You know, Joe, Joe D. Yeah. He's talking to him about the, about this virus. Very, very interesting insight. Just like this virus, you know, it's quarantining people, right? Mm-hmm. And then you see how you can infect other people. Imagine it's not a, a viral kind of virus. It's a, maybe like a thought virus. What if we're poisoning each other all day long with, we get close to somebody with our certain kind of negative thought, or we get close to somebody with our certain kind of negative attitude or something like that, and it infects them. And we all feel sick all the time. We all feel like crap all the time. We all feel like our life is meaningless all the time. We all feel, you know, we're in a rat race all the time because we're constantly being infected from all sides. No question. By this kind of negative thing, right? No so question. So you kind of can see from this like viral virus how if you just stop, nature kind of puts you back in your home, relax, you know, chill out, stay put. Everybody just stay put, like stop infecting each other. It was so clear when it appeared there that, like, how does the germ pass? Well, if it's, I heard today someone said, uh, you can hold the cart at the supermarket with your hands and it won't get into you. But if then you touch your eye, it gets into you. So it's like, we're all like coming into each other's space. And then we like bring, bring their, you know, viruses into ourselves, um, I'm losing the the focus a little bit on this, but I think I think you got what I'm trying to say here, right? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, it's tempting to get into it, but I think it will make us it will make us spend like a whole show just on that, uh, and we, we will do it next next on, our, on the next episode for sure. You know, we'll we'll, we'll get deeper into the virus, but uh, just to add to what you were saying, the interesting, you know, what the word virus comes from? I don't. It's interesting. Everybody's using it. It's a Latin word, and it means something like a liquid, slimy thing. It means the venom of the snake. So, mm. interestingly enough, as we discussed in earlier episodes, uh, it's the same venom that can also yield the 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 remedy, right? The antidote. If you just so something about the virus, something about how it makes us, you know, relate to one another. Somewhere there is also the solution to that. So I know it's a bit of a metaphysical leap, so we're just going to leave it as a, as a, as a thought exercise for the diligent uh, listener. Uh, but let's go back to the first century where uh, Titus Flavius the first century Josephus. Jewish yeah. tur- turned Roman historian Titus Flavius Josephus, in his meticulous style, details the misconducts of our forefathers. While the list of misdeeds is far too long for the scope of this book, it is important to realize how brutal was the hatred of the Judeans for their brethren. In the Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus offers some gruesome... So he wasn't an anti-Semite, he was a historian. No, he was a Jew, he was was a former Jew, by the way, everybody should know. Josephus offers some gruesome details on the foul manner with which, especially the kings of Israel, treated one another. When, for instance, Josephus writes about the anointing of... What's his name? King Yehoram. 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 Who ruled merely, yeah. near, merely 70 years after King Solomon, who taught that Solomon taught hate stirs strife and love covers all crimes. This other king says that as soon as he has taken the government no, upon Josephus him. No, Josephus says, yeah, as soon as. Yeah. Uh, Josephus says, as soon as he had taken the government upon him, Yoram betook himself to the slaughter of his brethren and his father's friends, who were the governors under him, and thence made a beginning and a demonstration of his wickedness. Nice. Yoram's fate, f- yeah, nice. Fate, by the way, was no better than that of his victims. He too was overthrown by. Yehu. Yehu. Yo, mm-hmm. who drew his bow and smote him in the back. Smote him in the, the arrow back. going through his heart. So Yoram fell down immediately and gave up the ghost. Details Josephus. From here, matters only go downhill. Downhill. When Josephus, when Josephus describes the atrocities that King Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, perpetrated against his own fold, he writes, he barbarously slew all the righteous men that were among the Hebrews. Nor would he spare the prophets, for he every day slew some of them, till Jerusalem was overflown with blood. Now, I just, just to say, you, you know, p- people might say, well, you know, everybody at that time was, you know, killing everyone. Maybe, perhaps, but uh, 
This is not a uh, commentary about everyone. This is a commentary about a group that was founded on brotherly love, right? So that seventy years ago was reached the highest level of unity and built the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. So, so the temple was a symbol of that. Uh, again, not the temple itself, not the, the the rocks, but as we read earlier, it was a it was a symbol of this um, unity of this love. It was an expression of that. Let's let's say let's put it this way. But let's let's uh, read on. Maybe there's so the ego hope. was growing. We also read yeah. at the beginning. Okay, here we go. Clearly, this demeanor was not suitable. It did take a couple more centuries of depravity for the system to finally collapse. But in the end, matters plunged to the point where calamity was clearly on the horizon. Realizing doom was near, King Josiah sent the high priest Eliakim to prophetess Deborah to ask if there was anything they could do to avert the blow. But as Josephus reports... When the prophetess had heard this from the messengers that were sent to her by the king, she bid them to go back to the king and say that God had already given sentence against them to destroy the people and cast them out of their country and deprive them of all the happiness they enjoyed. Once again, internal hatred had inflicted a catastrophe on Israel and the people were exiled to Babylon. Uh, Back to Babylon. It's almost Back like to Babylon again. Like Monopoly. I always grew up thinking that the, and learning that the Babylonians destroyed our temple. I didn't realize that we destroyed ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, and again just a word. You know, every time you say the word God, we should remind ourselves and uh, everybody listening that we're not talking about some some uh, vengeful or merciful God, but rather a law of nature. That's the only thing we're talking about: a law of nature, a law of connection, uh, a force. Okay, if you you know if you have doubts, if you say a law, what does it mean a law? Someone, a law means equals a force, right? The law of gravity is the force of gravity. Uh, we call it a law because it basically it binds us in a certain way. It creates, it puts a certain condition, a certain restriction on the elements in the system. So the same way here, there's a law of love. You break that law, you don't abide by that law. Get out, uh, and get out of my house. Get out of my house, exactly. And society just falls apart. Again, why? Because I think, uh, and I think this book is showing a little bit, that this is something that's left to our own choice. Unlike rocks and plants and animals that are sort of like within the system, we were given... It feels like, to me at least, I have a little bit of free choice there. I could choose to exercise it or not, to make efforts in that direction or, or not. And that what kind of like separates me from, from an animal. Otherwise, we, we, you know, we could all just be animals. Why do we need all the headache, right? Just stay monkeys. And, and, what a prof- and what a process it is, because if you were to take, you know, the best monkey possible. The best monkey. And the best one you could find, and you're like, okay, listen, monkey, you're going to... Do anything you want in this whole life. You can have anything, but it's going to take some time for him to 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 cultivate himself and figure out how to use tools and then how to think and how to engage other people. And he's going to seemingly make a lot of mistakes as he like, you know, okay, he figures out one thing. He figures out how to organize people and then he gets mad at him and then he kills him and then he does this. And, <laughs> you know, no, I'm looking at these people now with a little bit of sympathy because... You mean your fellow Jews? The, the people we're reading about in this story here. Yeah. Um, at first, I was, you know, five minutes ago, I was really angry at them. Kind of stupid idiots where they, you know, kill each other so brutally. And now I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking, well, who were these people? You know, who are people as people are developing and how do you get to a certain level? It's not like we have software. We just update the software. No. Right? The, it's the a, it's updating an, of the software. Yeah, it's is an organic like very, process. Analog organic process. Yeah, what's well, like yeah. it's like your kids. If you think about, it, we're, we're kids, except that uh, you know we're given everything is open before us. Like you know, you have the keys to the liquor cabinet, the gun safe, uh, the car keys, everything. <laughs> but you're still like a you know like a kid. Part of it is also reassuring because it's that's just kind of like maybe it's wishful thinking but because we don't have real answers on it but it doesn't seem like nature would create such conditions if the purpose would just be to destroy you know it's set up to contain these kind of behaviors i think we don't know enough about life and and death and the mistakes and everything we kind of this conversation this one little book right here is like could open up 
so many different topics. It could. I mean, even what you're saying now, if you, if you look at life, not just as the, you know, the 80, 90, hundred years that you live, but it's a whole rolling process. It's a process. And we're so like, we were just talking about where you said, oh, this, the, the virus came from some bat. You're like, no, but where did it come from? Like, if we look at everything as these big, you know, this whole process and not just, you know, my life started right now and that's how it is. And, you know, that's all there is, but we're part of this. Yeah. What's the purpose, uh, right? Say it again. What, what's the purpose? In New Jersey. I didn't hear you. All. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the purpose? The purpose? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what, uh, that's what this virus is, is, you know, making us question a little bit, you know, when you sit isolated for two weeks, Unless you're like binge watching every stupid thing you ever made, which is fine. Um, but for other people, listening to our podcast, yeah, well, that's a perfect thing to do in quarantine. Listen to the podcast and think about the meaning of your life. But the strength of the Jewish people was never measured by their number, but by their unity. The exile in Babylon lasted just as long as the Jews remained apart. The story of Esther tells us how the exile was to be overcome. First, the arch anti Semite Haman said to King Ahasuerus that the Jews were separated. There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among all the peoples in the provinces of your kingdom. Scattered That's and dispersed, the right? That, right there. Scattered and dispersed. The 17th century commentary on the Torah Kliyakar writes that a certain people scattered and dispersed means that they were scattered and dispersed from one another. Likewise, the prominent interpretation of Jewish law, Yalkut Yosef, takes separated to mean that there was separation of the hearts among them. Adding that the Jews do not observe the king's laws, it was a no-brainer for Haman to sway King Ahasuerus into granting him permission to exterminate them. Yet each year on Purim, we celebrate the miracle of our survival because in the very last minute, Mordechai, the Jew, united all of the Jews. Quote, go gather all the Jews, meaning tell them words of blandishment so that they will all be in one unity. Go gather as one the heart of all the Jews. This telling 18th century description by Chaim Yosef David, Azulai the Chida, demonstrates the desperation of Esther and Mordechai at the prospect of seeing their entire fold obliterated. It's very, it's very Go specific. Unite them quick, or we are going to die. Yeah, but but uh, use words of blandishment, which means a flattery. Right? What does that mean? It means flattery. flattery. Oh, really? Yeah, p- pleasing. When you want to sweet talk someone into doing something, it's like don't just say you know unite or die. So we're not in in this podcast. We're not suggesting that we unite or die. Although this may be a subtext. We're, what we are saying is that it's so much nicer to be together, and maybe sitting in isolation, pondering the meaning of life alone, uh, might feel you know might give you a little pinch, uh, and will remind you how great it is to uh, to be together. <laughs> You know, funny thing, I was at the beach uh, yesterday and my son threw a frisbee and it landed on the back of uh, uh, like an Arab fisherman. He was tending to his stuff. Uh, this was near Jaffa. And uh, I, I ran over. I was like, hey, it's, you know, sorry, bro, uh, about that. And he turns around uh, and he's like, no, let that be, you know, the worst that could happen. As long as it's not Corona, we're, <laughs> and we're like, we're about to hug there in tears. I mean, it's amazing how quickly, how easy it is to just, mm. you know, apply pressure on, on us humans. I mean, really, in moments, wow. uh, in moments, and suddenly everything disappears, and suddenly we're brothers in, uh, what do you call it, brothers in, not in arms, in sorrow, I guess. Point is that we always wait, you know, for the calamity, for the virus to come. Yeah, we have to, we have to proceed it. We have to run before the cart. Man, I'm thinking now, like, before the virus, how could you get everybody to slow down and chill out? Impossible. Like, it's, it feels impossible to get people to pay attention without something like this you know reading these old quotes uh i'm reading another one here the uh, torah emet a book says uh, it warns when all of israel are in complete unity no harm will come upon them indeed wicked haman complained about israel that they are scattered and separated right, people 
that there is separation of hearts among them. Therefore, Esther suggested that they would all gather in one place, become one bundle, and their salvation would quickly come. And as uh, was said in the previously mentioned Midrash uh, Tanchuma, if a person takes a bundle of reeds, he will certainly not be able to break them all at once, but taking one by one, even a small child can break them. This is the power of Israel. When they are all one bundle, when they are united together, they are rewarded and delivered. The first line, when all of Israel are in complete unity, no harm will come upon them. But I'm thinking about um, one of the um, interviews you you did on uh, recently, and you're talking about these issues that are coming. And I don't remember the guy you were talking with, and he said, "No, everything is fine. There's no problem." And it's like not seeing the virus or something like that. It's not seeing how can you expect somebody to, so you said we need to run ahead of the problem, right? Not wait for the blow to come. But if you don't even acknowledge that there's an issue, how do you even know? It's like the Kings we read about are killing each other. You know, it's like, if you don't even know what you're supposed to do, if you don't even know what game you're playing, how are you supposed to even do, do anything? There's no easy answer to that. What's the line that says uh, ignorance of the law does not, you know, excuse you, absolves you from from keeping the law? Like, okay, a law so is a law. We have to educate ourselves. You're right. Exactly. Okay, that's it. You, that's the answer. That's it's the answer. A, you don't know. You don't know. Okay. Well, well, too stop. Bad. Stop. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> stop for a second. Don't don't do anything. Don't you know? Don't go anywhere. Don't buy stuff. Oh, wait, this, what, what's happening now? Great. So let's use that, you know, to s- sit back, relax and think for a second, what the hell is happening? You know, if, if we're not going to think for ourselves, then nature is going to force us to think. That's, uh, that's how kind uh, and benevolent nature is. Th- this is uh, a great opportunity, I think, to do just that. Yeah, we have a few more mo- minutes. I think I'm thinking of there's like an, another couple of quotes here. I mean, he keeps making, he makes uh, the comparison to Egypt, how they were delivered under Moses' leadership outside of Egypt. And then they were given the, this Torah, the instructions for, for uniting when they, you know, uh, when they agreed to be as one man in one heart. Then they were given uh, this, um, you know, sovereignty, uh, sovereignty over the land of Israel. Now, after, you know, under Mordechai's leadership, they again regained their sovereignty and they were sent back to Israel to build a temple. So people, you know, forget about, often forget about that as well. It wasn't just like, oh, we were saved from Haman, uh, but rather it's, uh, it was a big step. And if you turn this whole historic tale into an in, kind of an internal or just a social kind of uh, commentary on what's happening between us, forget about the historic thing. Forget, you know, really look at it as these, separate desires in a separate force, separate inclinations were pulling in different directions as opposed to kind of uniting. Think of the, the peace that it brings inside a person, inside a society. Uh, th- this story could very well be about a person coming to terms with all his conflicting desires for, you know, you know I'll, I'll go there and I'll buy that and I'll do this and I'll do that. And if I just follow each and every desire and fulfill it, then I will be happy and complete forever and ever. But it never happens. It ends in a bloody mess every time. It ends with a bloody mess, <laughs> you know. Civil oh, war. Oh, or uh, Black Friday on the f- floors of Walmart. <laughs> so, so, someone gets hurt. Uh Let's read the, can you read the declaration of uh, King Cyrus? This is the middle of page uh, uh, 41, second paragraph. Every Cyrus declaration? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Every Jewish survivor, survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Wow. Right? Nice. It's like a and, and, gang or and after, like they give everyone free college, free uh, and <laughs> yeah, and after that, after this was carried after out, his, what did they say? After his order was carried out, King Cyrus brought out the utensils of the house of the Lord which Nebuchadnezzar had carried had plundered from Jerusalem and he put in the house of his and put uh, in, the in the house, house of his, his gods. gods. Yeah, he oh, brought, he took the things yeah, from the temple in Jerusalem. Brought him out his his temple? Yeah, he brought, he brought him out back to the Jews to you know, take it back home. Just like when they left oh, Egypt. Back to the, to, 
Yeah. Oh, well, just wow. when they left Egypt, they borrowed all those vessels from the Egyptians. Uh, and here again, they, they receive all those utensils. I mean, there's something about those utensils. We're not going to get into it. This is such, a, again, a reminder of uh, what Feels could like going be. down into a well and coming back up. Yeah. Going down into a well and coming yeah. back up. We're, we're only going to say this. We're, we're going to get into next on the next chapter... Uh, we're going to get uh, into more the blood. more blood. Well, there's going to be some blood. Yeah, some blood. Uh, the Romans and all of that. But uh, there's also going to be an interesting uh, chapter here about the 70 translators who almost saved the world. So that's interesting. Maybe, you know, this is kind of uh, fitting our time. Maybe we we need, uh, you know, an, a group of people to save the world. So maybe that will give us some. I want to binge listen to this podcast. I want to. I want to. I want to eat everything. I want to understand everything. I want to. I want to keep the conversation going. I want to. I want to understand life through the story. Whoever you are, if you're a Jew or not, you listen to Seth binge <laughs> listen to this podcast <laughs> in quarantine. Then read Seth's book Jew and Antidote to Anti-Semitism, and uh, and then binge listen to the podcast again because there's probably stuff you missed out on. And uh, we're gonna be back next week and get into um, uh, into these uh, the story of the seventy translators who almost saved the world. And you'll be with us. This is the True Function, the only podcast brave enough or stupid enough to uh, find out the root of anti-Semitism and the solution to it. And I, I, I dare say, maybe the solution to all the world's problems. It seems everything is kind of interconnected. Say I'm saying it. It's the solution to the world's problems. So try to do it here. Shalom from New Jersey, Yalla. And goodbye from uh, Israel. <laughs>